Uh, well, good, mor- good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's very nice to be here. Uh, perhaps I should say this is very much a personal account uh, of the uh, first dilution refrigerators uh, at Manchester. Uh, and uh, in uh, deference perhaps to Professor Watts, it was while I was a research student uh, under Eric Mendoza in 1964 that he, uh, uh, he, that Eric was writing the book with Brian Flowers, who was a Langworthy professor of physics at that time, writing the book on the properties of matter. Now, Eric, who was ebullient, certainly, uh, always told me what an excellent book it was. So, uh, we have now had a, a second opinion. Uh, so, um, this is the event leading up to the successful uh, dilution refrigerator in June of 1965. Now, uh, I have had a, a rather long and perhaps rather strange career. Um, I graduated with an honours degree in physics at uh, Birmingham University in, in 1963, and during my final year, I had uh, lectures from uh, Joe Vinan in low temperature physics. Now, Joe had just come to uh, Birmingham from Cambridge, and um, as a professor to set up uh, low temperature physics, uh, and uh, uh, he, his name is inextricably linked with that of uh, Henry Hall, so Hall and Vinan's experiments on rotating uh, uh, helium, uh, helium for superfluidity and the uh, loss, attenuation of sound, of second sound in uniformly rotating uh, helium. Uh, so it was really Joe Vinan who excited my interest in low temperature physics. I felt I wanted a, a, perhaps a change of scenery from Birmingham and I moved up to Manchester and I joined in September 1963 to uh, study for PhD. Now Henry by that time was the, Henry Hall was the head of low temperature physics group and I worked essentially under him but directly under um, Eric Mendoza. I'd visited him, uh, Eric, about two months before and um, uh, he showed me uh, this uh, article on the Harwell dilution refrigerator. Uh, these were the days before photocopiers, believe it or not, and I was given this very uh, uh, dilapidated few pieces of paper which had been produced by a chemical etching process, uh, and it was marked confidential, and uh, it was about this uh, wonderful method, or potentially wonderful method, involving helium-3 uh, and helium-4 as a uh, dilution uh, technique uh, available to uh, obtain low temperatures. And I remember two things. Firstly, um, Eric telling me that if this could be made to work, it would be the most important experimental technique in low temperature physics, or ultra-low temperature physics since the war. And the fact that we, 50 years later we have a conference like this, I think sort of uh, shows that uh, that uh, prophecy was correct. Uh, and the second thing uh, was he said uh, his rather prophetic words, if it could be made to work. And uh, uh, therein lay the, lay the crunch, because uh, it was uh, difficult to say the least in the early days. Now, helium-4, of course, is characterised by having a very simple and stable structure. Uh, the nucleus contains two protons and two neutrons, uh, and has no resultant momentum or angular momentum. The two orbital electrons um, completely fill the innermost K shell, so it's a very, very stable element indeed, and that's why it's so difficult to liquefy. Um, the method of liquefica- liquefaction is that you have to uh, overcome uh, the, uh, get the van der Waals forces uh, to produce the liquid. You have to go to ultra-low temperatures, and of course it was uh, Heike Kameni Onis at Leiden who first succeeded in doing this in 1908. Now, um, Leiden had the advantage that for about 20 years following this, uh, it was the only place really which uh, uh, embarked on low temperature physics, uh, and so had a a great uh, deal of success in this. And in fact, what was happening was that during that period they discovered superconductivity and took a lot of work on superconductivity, but later, in the 1920s, it was Camillion's successor who found this anomaly called the Lambda anomaly because it looks like the letter Lambda uh, back to front. 
which show that specific heat was doing crazy things. Uh, and uh, it's below this, and this is the superfluid region. Now, this is supposed to go to the next slide, I think. Was it late? Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. And so, again, this is uh, a well-known thing about helium uh, in helium. The important region is around one degree K, where you have almost... Uh, uh, oh, I say... Uh, yeah, I don't think I'll master that in my lecture. Yes. Uh, and uh, this is a superfluid region, which is very important here. And that's a lambda line. So at uh, temperatures below 1 degree K, you have almost entirely superfluid helium-4, which is characterised by having zero entropy uh, and um, zero viscosity, uh, and so on. Uh, now, it's fortunate for physics, uh, as well as obviously the dilution refrigerator, that in addition to helium-4, there's a stable isotope helium-3. And of course, uh, it has the same electronic structure, so in that sense they're identical, uh, but they have, um, uh, uh, helium-3 has uh, uh, one less neutron, and therefore obeys Fermi Dirac statistics rather than Bose-Einstein statistics. Now, um, if you look at the Rutherford-Bohr model of the atom, and I think it's important to mention the Rutherford-Bohr model of the atom, because uh, here we are in Manchester, and here we are in the Rutherford Lecture Theatre, um, they talk about one analogy is that the neutron is, uh, or the, uh, uh, the nucleus is equivalent to, say, an orange in the middle of St Paul's Cathedral. Now, uh, I recently attended a service at St Paul's Cathedral, and one of the impressions you get is it's large, to put it mildly. Um, and, in fact, the helium-3 obeys very, very different properties uh, to helium-4, and that is, it's got a finite heat capacity, it obeys Curie's law uh, down to a very low temperature, and the big question is, would it be superfluid? And that was a question which occupied people during the 1950s and 1960s, and it was discovered in 1972 that it is indeed superfluid. That was discovered at Cornell by Douglas Op uh, Doug Op Osheroff, Bob Richardson and David Lee, uh, but it's at 2 milli-degrees Kelvin, something like a thousand times lower uh, than superfluidity in helium-4, and it's a much richer and a much more uh, complex uh, situation. Now, in order to understand the dilution refrigerator, this is, uh, we have to look at helium-3, helium-4 mixtures. Uh, oh, what's that? Okay. Uh, helium-3, helium-4 mixtures, and um, up to uh, about 0.88 uh, of a degree, uh, they mix uh, totally, uh, and whether it's uh, superfluid or not will depend upon the uh, uh, degree of uh, concentration of helium-3. It's below this area, below about 0.8 of a degree, that you get a separation into two regions. Uh, one is uh, concentrated in helium-3, uh, almost pure helium-3. Uh, the second one, uh, and that of course, because helium-3 is lighter than helium-4, it's uh, on top of a dilute region, uh, which is here, which, according to classical physics, you would expect complete separation, but in fact, these are quantum liquids, and so there is in fact 6 degrees, 6% 6 uh, concentration of helium-3 in the helium-4. Now that was uh, first uh, uh, realised by uh, David Edwards and his uh, co-workers in Ohio State University. But what you've got is below a temperature of 0.8, so if you take a temperature say 0.1 of a degree, you've got essentially helium-3 lying on mm, a mixture of helium-3, 6% helium-3, in a superfluid environment of helium-4, uh, and there's a clear, visible boundary between the two. Um, and it was Hans London who proposed the idea that if somehow you could make uh, the 
uh, upper layer, which is essentially pure helium-3, because uh, the superfluid layer uh, uh, containing, uh, you can forget the superfluid layer, and if you can consider you've got a gas of helium-3 in um, a background matrix of helium-4, if you could cause an atom to move from a helium-3 to the uh, rich phase, to the helium-3 dilute phase, this is equivalent to uh, evaporation, and you should get some sort of cooling. Uh, now, this was the idea first put forward by uh, Hans London. And uh, the fact that you get 6% um, of helium-3 rather than a complete uh, separation uh, is due to the quantum nature of, of the fluids. Um, helium-3 obeys uh, Fermi Dirac statistics, and therefore it shows that as you initially put a helium-3 atom in a uh, helium-4 environment, this is energetically favourable, but the atoms have to go on according to the power exclusion principle, so they increase in energy, and you eventually at 6% get an equilibrium situation where it's no longer energetically more favourable for a helium atom to go uh, from the helium-3 rich phase to the helium-4 rich phase. But the fact that you've got this is uh, important for the uh, effective use of a dilution refrigerator. Now, in the next slide, uh, I have a uh, uh, diagram of the sort of basic principle of a dilution refrigerator. Now, the coldest region is here, uh, where you have a mixing chamber. And what happens is you have a, um, the dilute phase here, you go from the concentrated phase to the dilute phase, uh, cooling takes place in this region here, and it's here that you have to attach samples, and uh, then the dilute phase comes out and goes up here, it goes through heat exchangers, and the design of the heat exchangers is, is crucial. Uh, it then goes up to a still, which is at, say, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 of a degree uh, Kelvin. It's still in the liquid phase here. Now, the great advantage of a temperature like this at 0.6 of a degree is that the vapour pressure of helium-3 is several orders of magnitude greater than that of helium-4. So, helium-3 gas is pumped off preferentially. So, it's taken up to room temperature, it is circulated, it comes down to this condenser here at 1.2 degrees, you have a, uh, uh, a uh, constricting tube here, so you've got sufficient pressure here to condense the liquid, he, uh, helium-3 down here, again it's uh, cooled down by the heat exchangers and enters this. And um, so that is the idea which was put forward uh, by Heinz London. Now, I do have the, uh, a picture of, of Heinz London. Uh, in fact, he doesn't normally have science library written on him. Uh, but um, uh, he was uh, an interesting character, to put it mildly. Uh, he, uh, uh, he was of Germanic uh, extraction. He worked at uh, uh, Breslau University under uh, Franz Simon. Uh, and uh, uh, when the, uh, he came over in 1934, when uh, Nazi Germany uh, rose, as a result of the uh, auspices of uh, Frederick Lindemann, who was later Lord Churwell, uh, Churchill's scientific advisor, he brought across a whole lot of group, a whole group of people. Uh, Franz Simon was one, uh, Nicholas Curti was another, uh, Kurt Mendelssohn was another, and also um, Heinz London came along. During the Second World War, he actually worked on uh, the isotopic separation of uranium-238 and 235. Now it's uranium-235 which is crucial for producing an atomic bomb. And uh, therefore it's rather ironic that that is probably the most difficult isotopic separation is possible to have. Uh, whereas uh, his Heinz London's greatest uh, peacetime invention was the helium dilution refrigerator where the separation uh, takes place naturally. Um, so, um, experiments were carried out by London, Clark and Mendoza 
And in that rather classic paper in Physical Review in 1962, they decided, uh, they put forward various proposals uh, for a dilution refrigerator, which uh, Rudolf uh, de Bruyne Bota had talked about. Uh, and uh, uh, also, Henry was interested, Henry Hall was interested in this design, and they came up with uh, a decision to uh, build a dilution refrigerator. Now, Heinz London didn't particularly want it built at Harwell or uh, the work carried out at Harwell. Eric Mendoza was at uh, Manchester as a senior lecturer and uh, so the apparatus was uh, transported to here. And um, I worked with Eric and uh, a postdoc called David Phillips who came from the National Research Council at Ottawa and uh, we spent about 18 months uh, working on this thing. Uh, and uh, I was going to tell you about it, I'm going to say a few words about it, but it's best in fact, I think, to quote uh, Eric Mendoza's own words, and this is in the Royal Society Biographical Memoir for Heinz London. Heinz London died in 1970, and the Royal Society uh, biographical memoir appeared the following year, um, written by David Schoenberg, who was one of the pioneers in Britain of superconductivity and also uh, the de Haas van Alphen effect. And, and this is what he said um, The experiments occupy the best part of three years and were disastrous from the start. So it's not a very promising beginning, this. Uh, we now know that it could have have never have worked because of the convection instabilities at the bottom. But in fact, we never got that far. Uh, the main difficulty was simply that it had been badly constructed, the brazing of the stainless steel was bad, and our choice of big mercury pumps was ill-advised. No sooner did we detect one leak than another opened up. This was all very disheartening, particularly as we had no mass spectrometer leak detected to begin with, so that leak detection was uh, terribly slow. Now, um, that's something I can concur with. Um, it was only after two years that I managed to find money to buy a superannuated model from the Linac Group at Manchester. The Linac Group was the linear accelerator group, and they had a linear accelerator which must have been roughly where this building is now. I know uh, we did all our, our work on the uh, uh, one side of Oxford Road, where all the old buildings, the old Chester building was and I worked in the old Bragg building, and uh, this linear accelerator was there, and it said that Sam Devons left because he couldn't get the money to uh, pay for it, and uh, uh, Professor Paul left because he couldn't get the money to uh, run it, but um, uh, that was uh, the troubles with nuclear physics. Um, now, we wasted a lot of time on an elaborate gas handling setup, being obsessed by losing any helium-3, I remember there was paranoia about losing helium-3 in those days. We all cons also constructed a needlessly complicated temperature measuring cell down in the mixing chamber. The Heights insisted that there must be no argument about the temperatures we obtained, that only a paramagnetic salt with a very elaborately designed coils were good enough as a thermometer. With all this was in progress, we heard that the Leiden group under Taconis was also constructing a refrigerator. And that's the one which uh, Rudolf there mentioned and which they uh, presented at the um, Ohio State meeting, LT9, in 1964. I won't uh, uh, mention exactly what Eric said when he first discovered this, but you can probably get the gist of his message. Uh, we, uh, I've got some ancient photographs here uh, of this. Yeah, now this is uh, the black and white photography days, um, and uh, as you see, it was a bit of a leviathan, put it mildly. Uh, where's the, uh, sorry, I have to get a bit far away to hear this. That was the uh, apparatus for circulating it. It was a, a diffusion ejector, it was an enormous thing here, and uh, that I think was for um, pumping on the helium-4, uh, this is the uh, mixing chamber, that's, the, uh, 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 that's for condensing helium-4. Uh, many of you will remember uh, the, the days of Dexian. Uh, 
Yeah, this is this is it in a little bit more. Uh, this is the uh, uh, that is the mixing chamber. Oh dear, that's the mixing chamber. That's the uh, 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 that's the uh, uh, condenser. And uh, we used to have a can, a vacuum can, which we used to put on here. And as I was told, it was really a very big thing. And um, so we worked in the basement of what was then the Bragg building. And in fact, uh, it's now the Martin Harris building for music and drama. And uh, I visited it a few years ago. I also visited it just before the... Uh, before this mixture, uh, this meeting rather, and in fact the lab in which I work in is uh, now uh, a maintenance room, uh, and, and it's locked. Um, so, um, and uh, certainly I think in the present day strictures of health and safety, um, it, it wouldn't be possible going there, and even in those days the technical manager for physical laboratory um, is, uh, expressed doubts as to the suitability of the room. Um, we used to have a hand-operated lift uh, to carry the 25-litre doers down from the, uh, from the uh, ground floor to the basement. And as I said, we, we used to have these huge problems with leaks, and uh, occasionally Eric was a recital, the, a recital the jingle, a leak of week is all we seek. And life was very much like that, in fact, sometimes uh, a leak a week to find was uh, rather optimistic. Um, we also had <coughs> uh, this uh, system for measuring the flow meter. This was the Kronberger flow meter, which was essentially a Wheatstone bridge in which one of the arms uh, contained the, the mixture. And of course, uh, it, depending on the, the amount of mixture, you either unbalance the, the arm. <coughs> and in fact, in those times, uh, Hans Kronberger was the head of the Daresbury Laboratory, and I remember Eric and I visiting him on one occasion, and he had this uh, really um, uh, palatial office. And then one of the, the greatest impressions I had was two massive explosions of glass doers. I mean, in those days, uh, the doers were all glass, which did have the advantage that you can actually see the helium four going in, and... Um, these days, students don't see the actual spe rather spectacular uh, superfluid transition when uh, you get a rapid agitation of helium-4. As you go through the lambda point, it all comes very quiescent. Nowadays, with metal doers, uh, students no longer see this uh, exciting event. Um, anyway, you had these, these massive explosions because, in fact, the, helium, uh, the nitrogen doers were, were stored horizontally. Now, I now realise that this was the worst possible thing you should do because it places enormous stresses on the apparatus. Um, and the shards of glass everywhere uh, and a, a great explosion. Everyone came from neighbouring laboratories and offices to find out whether we were still alive, uh, which we were. We were a bit shaken. And I think Daffy got something in his eye, but I, I seem to be all right. I also remember trying to put up a vacuum can. So, I mean, this was a pretty big thing vacuum can. It was about uh, two feet long and a few inches in diameter. Uh, and uh, Daffod used to stand on a stool and my job was uh, to stand below it and shove the thing up and, and while well, he sold it into position. And um, Occasionally bits of soft solder and then later wood's metal used to drop on me. Uh, so it was, <laughs> it, it was an exciting event but uh, I'm still here and as far as I know Daffod is. Um, so, um, anyway, um, uh, th that's what happened. It was during that time, as a first year student, we, we did something rather novel. We had to do the Diploma of Advanced Studies in Science. Now, 50 years ago, um, there weren't many MSCs or higher degrees by, uh, by uh, uh, examination and lectures. So, it, after graduating, in my first year, I had to do uh, some extra lectures on quantum mechanics and solid state physics which the famous Sir Samuel Edwards gave and, um, uh, and these were given often in the large lecture theatre of the Schuster, the old Schuster laboratory which I think very tragically has been uh, dis uh, got rid of and outside was the uh, bust of Schuster which I see was outside there. I remember one student 
always used to put his motorcycle crash helmet on the uh, bust of, of Schuster, uh, which shows you that students are probably better uh, these days. Anyway, um, as I said, and I don't know if you were in there at the moment, uh, Eric Mendoza was appointed Chair of Physics at Bangor in North Wales, in the uh, University of Wales, uh, in 1964. I remember once going along with him, and I thought that Bangor was an absolutely beautiful place. Uh, and he, as I said, he was writing this classic book on properties of matter, and Brian Flowers used to quite regularly uh, visit this. And then, um, in 1965, early 1965, I'm not quite sure when, the whole thing was abandoned, uh, and um, Eric went to uh, Chair of Physics at Bangor. Dafford Phillips left and worked at Oxford Instruments, and in fact worked closely with Heinz London over quite a few years. Heinz London retained a great interest in the uh, dilution refrigerator, uh, and uh, together they developed a, a rather nifty osmotic pressure gauge to measure absolute temperature in the milli degree region and then it was just about at that time in 1970 uh, Dafford I think went to LT um, 12 in Tokyo and in fact uh, Heinz London had hoped to go but in fact he, he died and he was, he was really too ill. Um, so uh, Henry Hall had um, shown an interest in the, in the dilution refrigerator and uh, they, he decided to take over. Now, they had a, a working piece of equipment, and that was a great advantage. Uh, it was a successfully working piece of that equipment, and then they decided to put uh, um, an extra attachment onto it. And it was this that they got, we got going uh, in uh, uh, 1965. What happens is that the work of London, Clark and Mendoza had shown that the uh, concentration of helium-3 at the temperature had to be constant. So if you take, say, uh, here, uh, this is at, say, 0.1 and 6% of helium-3, by the time it had gone through to the still, it would be 1% of helium-3 and uh, a temperature, say, of about 0 0.6 of a degree Kelvin. And, of course, because the density of helium-3 is less than that of helium-4, the density of the mixture here is uh, greater, because there's more helium-4 here than here. And that could give rise to what is called a convective instability. In other words, we'd start cooling down, it would start going down quite nicely. We measured this with Allen Bradley resistors, and then finally we used... Uh, uh, for the ultimate low temperatures, we used uh, uh, CMN, serum magnesium nitrate, paramagnetic salt, and, uh, and we'll get the, uh, the final temperature. Um, but if you weren't careful, if you had the wrong, it, it was quite easy for the thing to suddenly start warming up because of this convective instability. And in fact, Heinz London had thought this might happen and worked out a potential uh, solutions for this, and uh, uh, eventually uh, we managed to have a configuration which overcame this problem uh, uh, and uh, the convective instability went away. It's very crucial on some of the dimensions of the apparatus. Um, the main other source of heat or important thing is the heat exchanger. Now this is uh, due to the Kapitza boundary resistance. Um, and that is a, a sort of an acoustic mismatch which takes place uh, and uh, that sort of often limited the amount of, uh, 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 of heat exchange which you could get. And one of the important things was to uh, improve the uh, quality of the heat exchanger, particularly you had to have a much bigger surface area of contact between uh, the dilute and the concentrated phases. Now, I, in fact, wrote up a master's thesis on the dilution refrigerator and uh, I got that at the end of 1965 and I went off to the University of Sussex and finally did a PhD, and got a PhD in early 1969 on a completely different area called the Kondo effect, which was metals and alloys. But um, I came up to Manchester, I think, well, to get my uh, master's degree and then uh, to hear the Simon Memorial Lecture. 
And this is a very appropriate moment to finish because the Simon Memorial Lecture was given by John Wheatley, of then of Illinois, and I was absolutely staggered at the progress and the success which they had made with the dilution refrigerators in that six month period when I was being away, when I was away. Um, and it's appropriate to finish here because the next speaker is John, is Oscar Vilches, who will tell us about uh, what John Wheatley did. And so I think this is a perfect moment to stop. Thank you. Well, we, okay, we got it going the first time in about June of 1965. And then Henry presented some data or the results at, um, in August of 1965 at a conference at St Andrews University in well, Scotland. And that was when it was first, I suppose, known to the world there. there was also a quantum fluid symposium which uh, was held at the University of Sussex shortly after arrival, we a few weeks or, or a few days at that of my arriving in August of 1965. John Wheatley was there. Now I would have presumed that was when he would have first heard about it. Uh, the famous paper um, which was Hall, Ford and Thompson took, uh, was, appeared in cryogenics in uh, I think it was April of 1966. But I was, I would have thought John Wheatley would have first heard it about it in August of 1965 when he attended that quantum fluid symposium. Now he gave a Simon Memorial Lecture to which Lady Simon was present. She lived to be 104 so she attended numerous of these uh, Simon Memorial Lectures. Uh, and I think actually it's probably January of 1966 and I was absolutely staggered at the progress that he'd made. Uh, I thought, well, what have we been doing? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. But uh, anyway, you can tell us more, I hope. <laughs> Some of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, was, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I was just interested in the gravitational instability part. I just wondered whether you started to coil the heat exchangers at that point. So you well, the yes, you, you change the height, you change the distance. Uh, you, you, we, I think we had a long tube which went down and then up. We shifted the, uh, the, the mixing chamber was still below the still, but not to the same extent, not as much as this would, would imply. Uh, but it, it was quite a, a delicate thing. Also, uh, the return tube, I think it was quite critical for di the diameter. I think we had a one millimeter tube and that, that dampened it down. I mean, it's dampened down by viscosity and I think diffusion of a helium-3. But it was, it, it was a sensitive pro, process, very much so, so that if you went... I know we changed the diameter of a tube and um, uh, the problems reappeared. So it was, you, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's perverse, but this is rather the nature of low temperature physics. If you change something from a so one millimetre diameter tube to a two millimetre diameter tube, a lot of your problems can come back or possibly go away. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, it was, uh, you know, physics is one thing, but trial and error seem to be the other. Okay, thank you.